Hello and thanks for watching Sunday Morning Live. This programme is not live. You are no longer able to interact with the show, so please don't call or text as you may still be charged. Enjoy the show. Thank you and good morning. Welcome to Sunday Morning Live here with the Salvation Army who are here to celebrate their 150th anniversary. Good morning, I'm Sean Williams. Also on today's program, blood, stem cell and organ donation, the simple act of giving saves lives. So why do so few of us do it? We hear from the mother of a teenager who died waiting for a donor and the journalist Sue Lloyd Roberts joins us with news on whether one has been found for her. Counter-terrorism in the classroom. Teachers are told to combat extremism. Is it spying on students or recognizing radicalism? After the Srebrenica massacre, the world vowed not to let it happen again. So why, 20 years on, is genocide still happening? And hours before the British Grand Prix at Silverstone, the Formula One legend, Sir Jackie Stewart, talks to us about racing and religion. It was as if God had said, whack. Never take anything for granted. Also this morning, Tommy Sandu is here with our interactive screen and will be sharing your reactions with us throughout the show. Good morning, Tommy. Morning, Sean. Yes, that's right. If any of the conversations today move you or inspire you, then you can get involved by calling our number 08459 555678. Calls cost up to five pence per minute from most landlines, but calls from mobiles can be considerably more. You can text as well. It's 81771 on the text number. Uh, calls and texts will be charged at your standard message rate. Or email us if you're on your tablet this morning, Sunday morning live at bbc.co.uk. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at at BBC SML, and you can use that as the hashtag as well. Join in with the debate with us. Sean. Thank you very much, Tommy. And joining us for our first debate this week, Sue Lloyd Roberts, a journalist with acute myeloid leukemia who's fighting to find a donor. Rabbi Laura Jani Klausner, the senior rabbi in the progressive Jewish movement Reform Judaism. Miriam Francois Gera, a journalist and broadcaster and Bishop Michael Nazir Ali, the former Bishop of Rochester, who also chaired ethics committees for the Human Fertility and Embryo Authority for many years. Welcome to you all. Thanks very much for Thank being you. here this morning. I owe my life to strangers. I lost four pints of blood after giving birth, and a series of blood transfusions brought me back to health. Like many people, I was extremely lucky that those anonymous donors made the effort to give blood because the numbers of new donors is falling by 40% over the past 10 years. There's an acute need for organ donors too. Three people will die today because no match has been found for them. Mirabella Al-Sheikh spoke to our reporter Asad Ahmed about her son Omar and their struggle to find a donor. She was an amazing person and very ambitious. Everywhere he went, everybody loved him, everywhere. What led to the diagnosis? He used to complain like he's tired and lack of energy and a bit of headaches. But then one day he went to play football with his friends and he fainted. You know, you just think, okay, he's having an infection, his hemoglobin is low, he's like, he needs some vitamins. You never think about cancer it's no you can't think about that and how did omar react to that devastating news first thing is coming to your mind when you got cancer is am i going to die is my son going to die and him he used to tell me mom am i going to die I say no no way you can't die and then they told us because the leukemia relapsed he needs a bone marrow transplant Otherwise, he can't survive. The first thing Omar said, oh my God, who's, who's going to donate for me? And how can we find a donor? Because uh, he's uh, mixed race. And then 
know so many people they are mixed race in England he used to say mom I don't know what I don't think they're gonna find a donor and then I don't know what's gonna happen to me he, he was yeah very and how did you react to him when he would say that I used to beg everyone please can you help us we need a donor we need people to donate to register for Anthony Nolan what is Anthony Nolan how you can register my son couldn't find the donor so unfortunately his situation was worse and worse and his body was so weak and the leukemia attacked everything so then he passed away Mirabella shortly before uh, Omar passed away he got married yes what happened there so he fell in love with this girl with Amy and basically they were together all the time and he said mom if I'm gonna meet God in any religion you have to marry and then live with someone so then I arrange everything and he was very very pleased that he can meet God and have nothing nothing bad to say so then he said I can die in peace now what's your message to someone like me to actually stop thinking about it and actually get on and donate if you donate you help somebody you gave life to somebody Omar wanted to bring awareness to people we want to let others know so we can make a difference he wanted to make a difference Mirabella Alsheikh talking about her son Omar. So when the gift of blood, stem cells or an organ could save a life, why are not more of us not helping? Have we become too selfish to be donors? Uh, Sue Lloyd Roberts is here, as we said, a, a journalist who has acute myeloid leukemia. And I imagine you can relate quite strongly Absolutely. to, to Omar's It's a experience. very moving report and my huge sympathy to Omar's family. It's, it's a, a real emotional roller coaster you go through. I have the same condition that Omar had, and, and like him, I collapsed. That's um, how I knew. I was diagnosed in January with acute myeloid leukemia. I've had two courses of chemotherapy, and I was awaiting my stem cell transplant. I was told I had a donor at the end of May, um, so I was delighted. Um, it's easier for me than Omar's family, a Welsh father, English mother, basic Caucasian. So I wasn't surprised that I found a, a donor quite easily. And so I prepared myself physically, which was a delight. I had to put on half a stone. And uh, psychologically, because the whole stem cell transplant is quite an ordeal. And then the day before I was due to go into hospital, I heard that my donor had failed his or her medical, which meant that they must have found there was an infection there, yeah. um, hepatitis, HIV, maybe he or she had cancer. But they were taken off the register, and my operation was cancelled. So it's been eight grueling weeks, and the Anthony Nolan organization have been wonderful. The BBC agreed to hold an open day here um, at New Broadcasting House, and hundreds of new donors came forward. I don't know whether it was because of that, but a couple of days ago, I've heard I have another donor, and I'm now due to go back into hospital in two weeks' time for my life-saving stem cell transplant. Because as you've oh, seen, it, it is life-saving. I mean, the doctors say without the transplant, with my condition, the prognosis is die. Mm. You, you die. That is amazing news. What was it like when you heard? It was wonderful. I was telling the bishop, I don't know if this had anything to do with it, but I um, happened to be filming last week. Um, the BBC have given me a new assignment to keep me distracted, which is good. <laughs> and I was in Westminster Abbey, and I've been asking all my friends of various faiths, as you can imagine, they've all been saying prayers for me. And um, you try everything, so I touched the tomb of Edward the Confessor, I lit myself yes. a candle, and ping, in my bag, my, my mobile phone went off with a message from the hospital that I had a donor. So the bishop is quite sure there's a connection, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and will you ever know who has helped save no, your the life? the whole thing is shrouded in secrecy. Of course I'll write a thank you letter, but, but you're not allowed to know your donor or make any contract for two years, I guess in case things go wrong and he's threatened with litigation. But of course, I mean, I, I love him already, whoever he or she is. Um, uh, I shall write an effusive thank you letter, and then when the two years is up, I, I would love to meet the donor and, and give him or her a big hug and thank them for my life. Well, the very best of luck for thank your you. operation. I, why do you think, Sue, so few of us 
donate our stem cells to help other people because there are lots of people still waiting. Is it quite a difficult process? No, it's not. It's very simple. Um, the, it's a little bit more than donating blood. You're, the donor is asked to have a, a course of injections over four days. I've had these injections myself, just a tiny jab in the tummy, I can even give it to myself to stimulate your stem cells. And then on the fifth day, they're asked to go into hospital for four or five hours to have a transfusion. And what happens is the blood comes out of one arm, goes into a box where the stem cells are extracted, and you get your blood back in the other arm, and your stem cells soon reinvigorate themselves. So yes, it's, it's five days. Um, with, with, with really, really not, not, not much bad feeling, a little bit of bone ache, apparently, but, but not a huge amount, and you are saving a life. I'm perplexed that not more people come forward, because when we held our open day at the BBC, the reaction was, was huge, and mm. people said they didn't know. And I think the problem is the message isn't getting across. Because if you look at all the league tables about giving in this country, we British have a very, very proud record of giving to charity, giving to disasters, giving to all kinds of causes. And so I think it's a question of the message getting across, that um, they, they, they like young donors. You, they prefer them under 30 because your stem cells are stronger. So really, we need to have notice boards in every university college mm. and approach young people. Um, in the synagogues, in the churches. I think that is the answer. And do you agree, Rabbi Laura, because it, is, it, is it a lack of knowledge? Are we scared? Are we selfish? What do you think it is? I don't think we're selfish. I think people are focused on survival. That's our basic instinct. And then you have to get information that says, this won't hurt you. I also think that people think donation equals heart. And so to hear stem cells and hear the details of how it is, can calm people down. We had last week uh, in our youth organization, the youth leaders preparing themselves for summer camps, and we had the Anthony Nolan Trust come in. And I think coming in and explaining, this is four injections, five hours, an ache, which will save a life. And just listening to you is so, mo you know, it's amazing. I think the th strongest thing when you said, and in two years, I will you know this it's 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 so wonderful and and the more that people speak and explain that the better and even for far more invasive um, organ donations if people understand what are the dangers and what aren't mm. they i believe will do more and i think we need to do role modeling you know what you said right at the beginning about losing blood and staying alive so when people hear the word donation they'll think of you they'll think of you that completely changes it and then they'll put in their purse like i have a donor card that's there, and, it, and it's there just in case. Do we all have donor cards, as every, or, or, or have people here donated? Well, um, I mean, it's, it's a great story uh, that we've heard from Sue, and um, I'm sure there's a connection with that with the confessor. But I think ignorance is, is an issue. Uh, people don't know what to do, especially with uh, respect to bone marrow, for instance. Uh, and uh, so uh, we need more knowledge of mm. exactly what it is that we are needed um, uh, for. But there is, I think, a question of generosity, of even sacrifice. I mean, there's a small element of sacrifice involved in this, and certainly the churches ought to teach generosity and sacrifice. I think a lot of people do donate blood if they, if they can because they know about it. Mm but they don't know about other things. So there is uh, more knowledge necessary. There is a little bit um, of welfareism. You know, people now expect the state to do everything mm. rather than themselves. Mm. But one of the things that I think we should note is the possibility of new technology. Uh, I mean, these, uh, you know, we are talking about adult stem cells as they are being used for treatment. But now we have the possibility of reprogramming uh, uh, adult uh, cells to behave like stem cells. And this has huge possibilities for treatment and even for the growing of new organs. Um, Miriam, there are some limitations to donating blood, for example. You can't give blood if you're on antibiotics. If you've had a tattoo in the past four months, you can't give blood if you're a sexually active gay man. Uh, how easy do you think it is for us to donate, whether it's stem cells or whether it's blood? Um, I mean, I, actually, when I was thinking about this, I, I recalled the last time I saw a, one of these blood banks, and it was um, on the high streets. Um, so I think they are relatively accessible, actually. It's just got to be that moment that you think to yourself, 
actually, instead of going to buy X or Y, I'm going to pop in and give some blood. And so that's where mm -hmm. um, I, I don't necessarily know that I share your optimism about our uh, broader culture. I think people are fundamentally quite selfish. I think we're, um, you know, in a, in a very uh, fast moving, fast paced life and, and people are in, you know, what, what do I need now and here? Yeah. And, and we're talking about quite invasive procedures in some cases, which I think it's important to demystify. People are willing to do them for cosmetic procedures quite regularly, but seemingly less willing to do well, them for in these cases. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because the Anthony Nolan Trust did a survey which suggested that people are more likely to help their pet than help a stranger. Mm. Does that surprise you? Uh, no, because people feel very attached to their pets <laughs> and quite frightened of strangers. So that makes sense if you ask that question. I think the question is, how do you change the dynamic? Mm -hmm. How do you introduce it so that people will be willing to give organs? And actually, quite a few people who give organs uh, are to family members as well because of the match of bloods. And how can that possibly work? I heard that 800 people in Yorkshire at the moment are waiting for life-saving transplants. They're waiting 10,000 in Britain. So lots of people are waiting. So how do we change the dynamic so that people feel safe? Because I think that counterbalances selfishness. I, I really don't like the word selfishness, so I would say a feeling of, of unsafety. And, you know, if you say, I'm going to donate any part of my body, I'm, my first reaction, as it should be as a human, is hands off. And then you have and to think... squeamishness. Mm. Yeah, squeamish. They don't want to confront yes. the fact yeah. that you're, and you're going to die and they're going to harvest yeah. your body for organs. Well, that well, can even, be quite Well, I think this is the thing, I and mean, we've shifted from blood and bone marrow perhaps which are renewable I mean immediately renewable to to organs now if it's a question of a live organ donation with somebody who's living well that's quite a sacrifice and we have to make sure for instance about consent uh, so that uh, people are not coerced into into giving an organ uh, we have to uh, in the case of people who have just died there is the question of continuity of respect for the dead I mean I share some concern about stripping a body for organs for instance uh, even where there has been prior that's quite a strong word stripping concern. well that's the word that's the, that's used in medicine um, and uh, even things like elective ventilation where okay the doctors say there's been uh, brain stem death mm -hmm. uh, but people are kept alive by with their hearts beating. So, so can I ask then, you would not be in favour in Wales in December, they're introducing uh, an opt-out, so yes. you will donate unless uh, your organs when you die, unless you have specifically requested to opt out. Are you in favour of that or not? No, I'm, I would not be in favour of that. I think consent is very important. Miriam? I'm in favour of it, actually. Um, I think you, um, as long as it's uh, popularised sufficiently that people are aware that it's coming into law, um, absolutely, if, it, if you object to something and you've got moral objections to it, certainly you should take the decisive move and go ahead and make that heard. But, um, yes, but people are not I, informed enough. I mean, I think well, to presume currently. that... Well, yeah. yes, That's but right. e uh, even ever. I, I, would mean, I think it's yeah. a very good system, and it also needs to be backed up with people understanding what it means. And also, there has to be, I think, some leeway that if that in fact you know you don't want lots of court cases where families saying I don't want this whatever they said mm -hmm. but the primary message which is we are people who are there to care for each other so opt out of that is a good one Tommy let's hear what the viewers are saying at home and then we'll hear from you again soon there really is so much Sean uh, about being a donor about receiving donors uh, Eric let's kick things off on Twitter Eric saying I'm not interested in someone else's organs so I won't be donating mine and when your time is up just simply accept it gracefully. Uh, Jenny, agreeing with you, Rabbi Laura, saying that I'm not sure that it is selfishness. Uh, it's more that people are scared. We need to educate people about the whys and wherefores of organ donation, is what Jenny says on our Facebook page. Paul, also on Facebook, says you should only be eligible to receive a donated organ if you are a registered donor. So it's kind of a, a like for like, is what Paul is saying. Uh, and Christopher uh, saying... I've tried to give blood. Now, this is talking about the practical side of things. Because I've tried to give blood, but you need to book months in advance. You can't just drop in and give blood on the day due to a lack of staff and cutbacks. And finally, Mike, uh, on the text 81771, saying blood donor service have stopped collecting at a local workplace due to falling numbers. And doesn't that make the whole situation worse? So lots of things to talk about around this, Sean. Thank you, Tommy. I think if you book online, you, you have to book a while in advance. Not sure if you just, you can, there are still drop-in centres, yeah. aren't there? Um, but, Sue, 
before we leave this discussion, what would you say to anyone who's listening today, watching today, and, and contemplating doing it for the first time? I say, please donate. I'm an example of somebody who I hope will have a, a much longer life expectancy than I thought I might have when I was first diagnosed. But um, I, I agree, I think it's a point of education. Um, I'm a surgeon's daughter, and when I first heard the word stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplant, I thought something surgical. The message needs to be got across that it's something very simple. Mm. And the other thing that I understand is essential in this country from the Anthony Nolan organization is for more of our ethnic minorities to donate. I'm a Caucasian. I was always quite confident I'd find a donor, and I have found a donor. But there's a, a huge a lack of organs among our Indian communities, our Afro-Caribbean communities, and, and really, really and exotic mixed race communities like Omar, alas. And, and they are the people who should be coming forward. Many thanks. And as you're saying, all the very best with the Thank operation. You. Thank you, Sue. If you'd like to know more about becoming a donor, there are links on our website. Here's the address, bbc.co.uk forward slash Sunday Morning Live. Today is a big day in the Formula One calendar because it's the weekend of the British Grand Prix. Hardeep Singh Kohli will be talking to Sir Jackie Stewart about the reigning world champion Lewis Hamilton's chances later on. I think that he will win the British Grand Prix uh, because that's the most important Grand Prix, your own one, to do it in front of your own folk. There'll be 140,000 people at Silverstone this weekend watching. First, we are in the shadows of a terrorist attack in Tunisia last week and days from remembering the London bombings 10 years ago. The Prime Minister is calling for all of us to be more intolerant of intolerance and guidelines are now in place requiring schools to play a larger role in the battle against radicalisation of young people. But the measures under the Counter-Terrorism and Security Act are dividing opinion among teachers and pupils. Some fear the move will turn teachers into spies and close down debate in the classroom. Others see the new rules as safeguarding rather than surveillance. Guzzi Khan is a teacher from Coventry. We asked him what he thought of the new measures. The current recommendations from the government won't stop radicalisation or extremism. It's because young people have to be understood and tolerated and I think it's far too broad. Uh, a teacher will look at an individual and something that they say that they feel might be extreme or controversial, another teacher that knows that individual will be able to understand there's a specific family background with that child and that's the reason why they're saying things. So it's, it's very, very ambiguous, I think. A lot of things that are said can be construed as terrible or evil or hateful, but when it comes to young people, what the, the things that they say might be taken from popular culture, it might be taken from a song, and identifying them as extremists as a result it seems ludicrous to me. Identifying what is an extremist view and what is somebody developing themselves really is a very, very difficult task. If there's a tag of it, a potential extremist that's going to be put on a child, they may not come forth and discuss what they feel, and as a teacher, you subsequently won't be able to guide them towards the right decision or guide them towards the right viewpoint. So it's actually it is inhibiting, I think, yeah. Are there the people in school who are well-versed and well-trained enough to deal with and spot the signs of extremism? Uh, within, within the education sector myself, I personally don't think that that's the case. Is there enough training happening? Is there enough of an understanding as to why it takes place? I don't think so. There will be certain people that say, well, what is the alternative to this proposed government policy? I think it's so important that you maintain channels of communication. I think the main issue that people are finding from all different facets of teaching is that this new framework actually limits that communication. Unless you allow a young person not to feel that they are uh, being demonised, marginalised and they're an individual that's extreme, how can you really ever have effective communication and subsequently try to solve the problem? Our thanks to Guzzi Khan, who's a teacher from Coventry. Uh, let's discuss this. Joining our panel this morning, the Associate Director of the Henry Jackson Society, journalist and commentator, Douglas Murray. Welcome to the programme. And, of course, you can continue to text, call, email and use social media to tell us what you think Tommy will be letting us know later in the show. Uh, Douglas, you heard there Guzzi Khan saying, the problem with trying to combat extremism is that actually the term itself is fairly ambiguous. How would you define it? It's not ambiguous in the government's definition, which is very clear now. Uh, the government defines extremism as uh, opposition to fundamental British values, uh, such as the rule of law, democracy, liberal values, and indeed uh, tolerance of other people's faiths. That's what the government 
guidelines now set out. It's, it's a pretty good working definition of what I think most of us would agree that uh, uh, extremism constitutes. And what's more, the government expresses the view uh, that uh, this is an extremism which it is on the lookout for, as it were, wherever it may come from. Uh, albeit there are very specific things at the moment. Do you agree, Miriam? Is extremism something that's easy to define, easy to spot, and, and anyone can, can do it and alert authorities if need be? Well, evidently not, because this government has struggled to pin down the definition of extremism uh, throughout its uh, time in power, so it's obviously not that clear. Uh, and I would actually argue that the current definition isn't that clear either. Um, I mean, British values is a nebulous term, uh, and what's constituted British values has evolved um, quite significantly over time. But David Cameron says they are of peace, democracy, tolerance and freedom. Those are our values. Yes, and uh, I think Nikki Morgan was on a show recently saying that uh, one of the values that would be considered extreme is homophobia, having been somebody who voted twice against gay marriage. I mean, there are uh, lots of people who might get caught up in this definition of extremism uh, who might not otherwise be uh, considered to be extreme. And that's where I would say that I'm not actually sure that the government should be on the hunt for extremists. There are extremes uh, in all societies. Um, they're called the fringes, and we have to monitor them. But what the government should be focusing on is violence and terrorism and what we need therefore is good cooperation between the communities so that they're not branded extreme uh, and so that sufficient intelligence can be garnered to identify the threat of violence that's where the objective should be Bishop Michael just want to pick up on your first point that you made Miriam about uh, Nikki Morgan saying homophobia may be a sign of extremism well yes what, I mean when the Prime Minister says uh, to be intolerant of intolerance I mean that itself is intolerant you know what we don't want is a kind of liberal totalitarianism I mean that's no better than any other kind of totalitarianism and um, yes I agree with Miriam I think extremism can be of many different kinds what we should be concerned about is ideological extremism that leads to violence or to unjust discrimination against persons in the public place or at, in their employment or whatever. I think that is what we ought to be looking for. Otherwise, uh, what we are doing, uh, we are in danger of doing, is bringing up children uh, not to value free speech and free thought. And that would be uh, very sad for society. Well, let's have a look at that. I mean, it, it, I think it'd be more than sad. I think it's dangerous for tragic, society. Tragic, perhaps, yes. What, dangerous for teachers to effectively become spies in well, the classroom? Dangerous for debate to be squashed, yes. because it's about what happens with behaviour. So if I'm frightened of speaking my mind and being challenged, then I'm going to shut up. Yes. Mm. And the most important thing is I say something absolutely wrong, absolutely uh, ridiculous, yeah. and you say, yeah. no, yeah. and as your mm -hmm. teacher, you challenge me. Yes. Now, if I think yes. that what I say, which is borderline, or I'm trying, we have what, with kids, we call a moratorium. It means yeah. that you can play out a whole load of views, and you don't actually have to do them. It's like play, role play. So teachers yeah. are there to enable pupils to role play. If they can't role play, they will take their frustration somewhere else. But this kind of thinking is not limited to to children, is it? I mean, this is going to overflow into wider society. Of course, of course, and, but, but, it, but and, it's the schools which has been the focus yes. this week. Will it close down debate? And if it does, no, is I that mean, quite dangerous? I, I don't think so. Um, look, it's, it's worth remembering what this is and what it isn't. This is not putting the totality of the government's counterterrorism policy responsibility on the shoulders of teachers. It really is not. What the government is doing, and this is just a, a part of it, is they are trying to find a cross-departmental um, policy towards extremism. Obviously the case of, among others, the girls from Bethnal Green who went to join ISIS recently, earlier this year, is an example and a demonstration of the fact that it's a real concern and that it obviously includes an element of, um, of responsibility within the teaching profession. But this is not, as I say, only the teaching profession. It's about, and the whole government counter-terrorism, counter-extremism policy is about all sorts of parts of society. Um, the Charity Commission, for instance, being given the powers to, uh, to more rigorously pursue those uh, organisations which use ch British charity law uh, to help extremism. Well, Another example, Ofcom, uh, uh, channels which often in foreign languages broadcast into the UK extremist material. Yeah. This is just how, one part how of very it. very British. You know. let's, let's shut down uh, channels that we think express no. illiberal views. No, 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 hang on, Miriam, that's no, 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 quite no, no, just no, 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 um, yeah, I just wanted to come back on uh, the Bethnal Green example, which actually is a very poor example because the girls, um, for all intents and purposes, appear to have been radicalised in their bedrooms online. There's no evidence that they were radicalised.
socialized within their schools. But I think it's really important for us to think carefully about what we want our schools to do. Mm -hmm. That is, what kind of spaces do we want schools to be? Are there spaces of trust between the community, educators and children? Or do we want to turn them into an extension of the government? That's a big problem. Yeah. What is good about this is the multi-layered. It's saying all sectors of society are responsible for all sectors of society. So let's look at schools, let's look at community centres and say what are we doing? So I, I like the fact that the government is not just uh, looking at one area but is saying we are all affected by what's happening we will all be affected by what's happening the level of detail and the level of how much someone is felt that they have to be silenced or about the internet filters as well which is one of the issues how on earth are you going to do that effectively that those are questions but the idea that we are all responsible for each other is linked to donation of organs and yeah. is linked to this uh, sure, just very quickly Douglas. i must come back Douglas, on to two points that miriam made the first is, there's, there's, you really shouldn't portray the shutting down of extremist hate preachers who preach terrorism, preach hatred of British society, and say that that being shut down is stopping free speech. It really is not. Well, there are laws is. on incitement Just in this country, and they should right. exist on the airwaves as well as uh, elsewhere. And if you call for incitement, if you're an incitement preacher, then that is something that should concern, off common concern in this country. Secondly, on the case but of is the it just Greek hate? Greek. Sorry, sorry, Douglas. May I just ask? Mm. Are you talking about? Uh, I mean, hate is a sort of rather vague sure. term. Are you talking about violence and discrimination? That's because international law forbids there, that, yeah. of course. Right. Yes. Uh, there absolutely. Are already but laws it is in something place. which, in recent years, many examples of, of, of that going on on the airways. But just quickly, also on the Bethnal Green case, this isn't about whether or not they were radicalised at school or at home. The point about this is: Can you help teachers look for the signs? of radicalization that these girls at Bethnal Green School would arguably have shown. Now, I, I have to stress, this is not, again, only about teachers. It's very hard if, if often a parent doesn't even notice their child is being radicalized, or, 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 a, or a husband, as we saw recently, of, of the, the women who recently went doesn't notice it or, or says they don't notice it. But it is incumbent, I think, and possible that you could uh, prevent some of these cases by at least arming teachers with the knowledge of what to look out for. And that's all this is. Okay. It is not spying. I, it is yeah. doing everything that everybody else I'd can like do to, as well. I'd like to bring in so, Mavis yeah. Hyman. Yeah. In a sec, we'll be back with you. I'd like to bring in Mavis Hyman. Um, and uh, Mavis's daughter, Miriam, lost her life in the 7-7 bombings. Um, welcome to the programme. Thank you very much for joining us at, at what must be quite a difficult time for you. And I know you have a lot of interest in, in combating extremism at schools. I just want to ask you first, though, how are you remembering your daughter 10 years on? Just tell us a little bit of what, what she was like. She was a very caring person. She was very concerned about the welfare of the people around her, of all creatures around her. And I think that she would have been very satisfied with what we are trying to do, which is a constructive approach to life and we are starting our journey through children in schools. We are starting with children in secondary schools but we do hope to extend our program to children who are still in primary school. And how are you doing that Mavis? Well what we are trying to do is to provide prevention from all forms of terrorism, all forms of extremism. And we are aiming to do this by introducing a program of work which is not only within the national curriculum of the whole of the UK, but is also uh, an extension of the ideas that are fixed on simply academic learning. We go beyond academic learning and we go into spheres of preparing children for life skills. But, we, but we hope to give them life skills. Yes, but Ma Mavis, what, do, what, what specifically uh, does the program do to try to combat extremism? When you're talking to children about their life skills, how do you bring those thoughts in so that they don't become radicalized? Well, we create, we hope to create a constructive mindset. That is, we, there is nothing political in our program, there is nothing religious in our program, there is nothing negative in our program. We concentrate 
only on the positive. So we feel that if we can create a constructive mindset in young people, that they will be aware that they should be thinking in a way which is constructive. And they do this first by learning to listen carefully, to listen with discrimination, to be able to process what they think independently, that they should be able to therefore act rationally. And I think that the other parts of the program have really to do with intercultural awareness. That is, we give the young people opportunities to be able to experience a different culture. Okay. Yes. All right. Many thanks, Mavis, for that. Uh, and. Uh, and how anti, how extremism is being tackled there in schools, primary schools, with a positive attitude and much more understanding about other people's cultures. Let's find out uh, from Tommy what you're saying at home about all this. Tommy? Thank you, Sean. Yes, uh, lots of people are getting in touch. Let's hear from Daniel on our Facebook page who says, it's about time parents stepped up and stopped passing the buck. It's got nothing to do with schools unless they're religious schools. Barbara saying, I think it's disgraceful that teachers are asked to be the eyes and ears of Big Brother. Their job is to educate children and not to police them. So questioning what kind of role the schools really play in this. Uh, Vicky on Facebook says, surely the cure is for us to all have more tolerance, not less. And Marion in Tunbridge Wells says, we need to clamp down on the mosques that are promoting extremism rather than schools. And Naz on the text saying extremism is not simple, kind of a point that Guzzi was making earlier on. It's not extreme, it's extremism is not simple to define, and in particular, uh, putting this into practice in schools is doomed to fail. All right, Tommy, thank you very much. Bishop Michael, what about that point that said we should be focusing on the mosque rather than the school, that we're actually looking in the wrong place for extremism? Well, I think there are several different um, aspects to this. There's international, uh, there's the international dimension. I mean, if we were not producing conditions in, say, a country like Syria that promoted radicalization, some of the problems that have been mentioned on this program would not exist. I mean, we've destroyed a perfectly good country and created problems for ourselves. So that has to be kept in mind. Then there's cyberspace. I mean, this cannot be underestimated. People are picking up these ideas, not from the classroom, not in the mosque, but they are picking them up from the Internet. Of course, uh, the government's own policies in the past, coming back home, have uh, encouraged isolation of communities. Uh, the communities themselves may have desired it, but the government has also helped with housing, schooling, community centers that all catered for isolation rather than integration. So your view is that it has to be, as Douglas and, and uh, Rabbi Laura were saying earlier, it has to be across the board. It's not one thing. If you're going to tackle this, it has to be internet, schools, mosques, everywhere. Yes, so it has to be across okay. the board, but at the same time, we must not give up uh, things like f uh, freedom of thought and speech. Without stifling debate. Yeah. Quite a tricky thing. Douglas, we'll be back with you in a sec. Thank you very much. And thank you at home for your thoughts on that. Do keep them coming in. So Jackie Stewart is the most successful British racing driver ever with three world championships on British Grand Prix weekend. We sent Hardeep Singh Kohli to meet the great Scott. <laughs> It was the swinging 60s and 70s. It was free love to a lot of people, and it was an exciting time of fashion and music, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. There was an awful lot of goings on that made it very exciting, colorful, and glamorous for us to travel exotic places. It was a rocket ship. There seemed at your core to be a kind of a moral code, uh, a way of living. I learned from watching Jim Clark and a man called Fangio, who is probably the greatest driver of all time, that you had to live a, a more normal life in order to achieve the higher levels. So there are certain so-called sacrifices you make, perhaps. Uh, you know, I've never been drunk in my life, even as a young kid, because I was shooting from the age of 14, so I couldn't drink if I was shooting. 
and I was I suddenly was good at shooting because I'm a hopeless dyslexic. I mean, I'm a very See, severe dyslexic. I so wanted to talk about your dyslexia because, in a way, were it not for your dyslexia, you probably wouldn't have ended up being three times world champion. Probably one, not, probably. because you're such a failure at school. You're told you're useless. You had a brutal time at school, didn't very you? Very brutal. Uh, I mean, it was the worst time of my life. When I found out I was a dyslexic, only at 42 years of age, previously, I, I thought I really was stupid, dumb and thick. Helen never knew until I was 42. We were married when I was 23. I had hidden it from her that I couldn't read or write. I could have ended up a disaster. But it had a profound effect on my life because you can't think like the clever folk. So you think out the box. You find other ways of doing things. Sport was my other way. You drove at a time when there was genuine romance, where it was a man against the elements. It, it isn't like it is. It's, it feels sanitised today. I think it is different because it's so safe. They don't have the same fear. They don't have the same threat. So perhaps they don't need to have the same personality to overcome that. Maybe not. It certainly builds your character. I don't know about your personality, but your character has to be built because you've got to consume all of those things and act accordingly with it. You watch those cars, there is very little protection. Oh, yeah. Very little protection. You must have had some ego as you got into that car, thinking, I, I am indestructible, I, I no? I don't know if it was ego. No, I didn't think I was ever indestructible. I never drew blood from my body driving a racing car, actually. I tell everybody I never drove fast enough to, to, to draw blood. Uh, and there are some English people who say that there might not be blood drawn from a Scotsman. <laughs> uh, but my logic was, and I learned this from the best, from Fangio and, 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 and Jim Clark, that you didn't overdrive. You didn't overtry. You had to keep the car on the road. I had very few incidents in my entire racing life. I had one big accident through aquaplaning. But... You learn to drive within your own limitations. Jackie Stewart races on to win. The racing driver today doesn't understand this, but, you know, when an accident happens and fatalities occur, you know, there's so many people, the wife or the girlfriend's there, sometimes the father and the mother, so there's that, which is a traumatic experience. Then there's the funeral. We counted, Helen and I, uh, 57 people who died who were close enough to us to be friends, holiday with, dined with, travelled with, everything. So I've been to more funerals, memorial services and so forth than most anybody that certainly I know. So therefore, for whatever reason, although I wasn't a churchgoer, I certainly deeply believe in God. And there's a strong power up there. And boy, can it help you. Today, I walk into churches, whether it's in... Abu Dhabi or Bahrain or whether it's in India or wherever it may be that I'm in, if the doors open, I walk in and I just have a prayer and I leave. And that prayer generally is to say thank you. What are you saying thank you for? For everything that's happened for my family. I've got a fantastic family. I've got two wonderful boys. I've got a wonderful wife. I've got nine grandchildren and they're all healthy and well. There have been traumatic experiences but we've come through them by the help of or assistance of uh, that enormous energy up there, I believe. You've lost a lot of friends, a lot of dear friends, a lot of colleagues, people that were akin to family for you. I'm just wondering, who do you miss the most? Who? All of them. Francois Sever died, who was my teammate and would surely have gone on to win the World Championship when I retired. I hadn't told him I was going to retire and we went to our last race. I had already secured the World Championship, which was fantastic, knowing I was never going to do it again. And it would have been my 100th Grand Prix, which would have been a great way to stop. And then I hoped that I would win it. But Francois was killed on the Saturday of the Sunday race. And it was as if, you know, by which time Ford Motor Company had decided to give me a big dinner in London to celebrate my retirement. I won the World Championship. I won that year the World Sportsman of the Year. I won the American Sportsman of the Year. I had everything going for me. Bang. It was as if 
God had said, whack. Never take anything for granted. And, you know, it ended in tears after all these years. The Grand Prix, what are your predictions? Do you think Hamilton's going to win and equal your record of three times champion? I think he'll equal it this year. I think he will be world champion this year. I think that he will win, win the British Grand Prix uh, because that's the most important Grand Prix, your own one, to do it in front of your own folk. There'll be 140,000 people at Silverstone this weekend watching and their biggest hope in most cases is for Lewis Hamilton, a Brit, to win the Grand Prix. All things been equal, uh, Fangio, Senna, Clark, Hill, Stewart, Prost. Mansell, Schumacher, Prost, all at their height, all at their prime, where would Sir Jackie Stewart finish? I know where Mr Fangio would be. Where would he be? He would be top. You'd probably be second then. <laughs> I think you'd be first. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Listen, thank you very much. It's an absolute delight to meet you. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Of course, it'd be first, Sir Jackie Stewart. Just a reminder, the British Grand Prix is on today at 12.15 on BBC One. To more sombre news now. It's almost 20 years since a massacre in what was Yugoslavia made global headlines. More than 8,000 Muslim men and boys were killed in Srebrenica. It was the worst atrocity in European history since World War II. But what made neighbours turn on each other and why, two decades later, is genocide continuing elsewhere? Miriam Francois Gera has been to Srebrenica and heard from a group of young people, all born in the year of the genocide, to try to understand what lessons, if any, have been learned. And we'll talk to Miriam in just a moment. First, though, here's a clip from that documentary. We've now got the chance to meet some of the women who lost their husbands and sons. They're known as the mothers of Srebrenica. On the 11th of July 1995, within one day, I lost, I lost 23 family members. As they will, they will, quite often they say, we, we died a long time ago, but we are just waiting for our turn to be buried. I buried my youngest son. His last words were, Mom, don't worry, everything is going to be okay. Trust me, trust me, I have no strength to talk about it, because my soul is in pain. Hearing the mother's stories overwhelms everyone. I, I promise, I promise I will do everything I can to help this never ever happen again. Um, I'm from the Congo, my parents are from the Congo, so we know a lot about war Congo. and suffering and what's going on, so I definitely sympathise with what's happened in Trebunitsa. Your kindness reminds me of my grandmother. <laughs> That's a clip from A Deadly Warning, Srebrenica Revisited. It's on tomorrow night at 10.35 on BBC One. Have we learned any lessons from Srebrenica? <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, or is future genocide still inevitable? Joining our debate, we have Dr. Michael Price, who's an evolutionary psychologist at Brunel University. And from our BBC studio in Edinburgh, Professor Donald Bloxham, who's an expert in genocide studies at the University of Edinburgh. But uh, Miriam first, what was it like hearing and seeing those reactions from young people? It was almost as though they were hearing their history for the first time. Well, in some cases they were. In some cases these young people who were born in the same year as the genocide had never even heard of it. And so for them it was so important to recognise this as part of our shared history. And for many of them that's something actually that they came away with. They were saying, you know, we need to integrate these stories into our renewed understanding of what British history is. You know, this is mainland Europe. This is a genocide that happened 20 years ago and yet so many of us don't know anything about it. There was a, a draft resolution from Britain wanting the UN to condemn Srebrenica as a genocide, but not everybody is happy with that wording. So I want to bring in Donald, who's an expert on genocide. How do we define it? Well, there's a, there's a legal ex uh, definition, the 1948 uh, United Nations Genocide Convention, 
Now, this is not entirely unproblematic. It talks about acts committed um, pursuant to the intent to destroy in whole or in part ethnic, national, racial or religious groups. Now, we know these days how fuzzy and how constructed those categories are. Um, for instance, in Nazi Germany, many Jews were murdered by the Nazis who did not self-identify as Jews. They converted to Christianity or were, were not religious at all. So what we may say is that the, the idea of the group that is destroyed in whole or in part is very much, or in many ways, in part a creation of the perpetrator's mind. They perceive groups that they give a kind of spurious identity or political agenda to as acting as a collective and strike to destroy that collective, uh, either entirely or to some significant degree, to stop it functioning. Michael Price, you're an evolutionary psychologist. Do you agree? Is it, is it not just sort of turning neighbour against neighbour, but somehow demonising an entire group, and, and that's the way that they use as, a, as an excuse to try to eradicate them? Yeah, I mean, I think the most important issue is really not just containing these animosities that are sort of simmering under the surface all the time, but because if that happens, then and the only thing stopping people from, from killing each other is some strong central government, then if that government's weakened, then everything can just get out of control very quickly. So I think the focus has to be on not just containing containing animosities, but on moving past them. And, um, and I think you have to remember that um, human nature has adaptations not just for intergroup conflict and competition, but for dispute resolution and peaceful, uh, peaceful ways of reconciliation and cooperation. And we have to encourage those aspects of human nature so that it, it, in, in order to overcome these sort of simmering animosities. Um, and there's a lot of great work going on by people like uh, psychologist Michael McCulloch on how we're adapted for forgiveness and reconciliation. And I think we need to start, it's never too early to start applying some of those lessons. Are we adapted, Douglas, to forgiveness and reconciliation? I'm sure we are. I mean, uh, I just the thing I mention is that when you say uh, you know are these things inevitable I mean it's it's a bit tricky uh, this because in, in one way we all know that human nature doesn't change and that uh, certainly in the Judeo-Christian tradition the idea of you know in, intrinsic evil and original sin is 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 a central and I think in a way quite useful demonstration of uh, of what Immanuel Kant would describe as a crooked Rabbi timber Laura from which we're made ahead yes. of that. but I'm sorry, oh, Douglas. Um, original sin belongs to you, not to right, me. Right, I was going to ah. say, yeah. <laughs> yes. We're born. Okay. Sin we're there. We don't do sure. that original sin thing. But the, the Christian tradition of it obviously comes from the book of Genesis. And, and for How very specific reasons. Yes, exactly. How it's been but, interpreted. But the or I would say misinterpreted. <laughs> Your misinterpretation. Um, anyhow, my point was not to make a Catholic <laughs> social point. Um, but, but rather just to mention that, you know, uh, the, the, the interesting thing really is that we are at the same time both, in, both capable and we know we're capable of these terrible, terrible things. At the same time, we also know that we are capable and we see examples all the time in our daily lives and in a much larger context of forgiveness, of people moving beyond uh, uh, such animosities. So, so that, and that's really the only reason anyone can continue. I'd like to ask Donald um, from Edinburgh whether he believes that the world has become more peaceful or more violent. Are there more genocides than there were previously? Quantitative question, very difficult to answer because it so much hinges upon definition, but I would say that there's no reason whatsoever to expect that the incidence of genocide will diminish uh, in the years and generations to come. Why not? Well, there are a number of reasons to this because genocide can be committed along so many different cleavages and for so many different reasons. But okay. to take the most obvious instance, which uh, will preoccupy us, I suppose, in the generations to come, uh, competition over scarce, uh, increasingly scarce resources. Scarcity of resources. Um, I, I know that Michael wanted to come in well, there think, just to challenge something. There's many more reasons to be optimistic than, than that. I mean, I think Steven Pinker wrote a book a few years ago called The Better Angels of Our Nature, which is all about the decline of violence over not just the past few hundred years, but the past few thousand years since we've been hunter-gatherers. Dramatic declines. We're much less violent. If you look at the data, the stats, we're much less violent than we have ever have ever been yeah. uh, over, over history. Uh, there, is, there is a rider to that, of course. It's a wonderful book, Stephen Pinker's book, but, of course, there is the right that the technology and That's the capability right. we now have mm. means that, and Stephen Pinker's book sort of slightly do dodges that, that you know, the, the exceptions helpful? are massive, massive and, exceptions. And, and his book came out in 2011 and uh, 180,000 people were killed in internal conflicts, a number three times higher, right. three and a half times higher than it was when, when he first wrote the book. So I just wonder yeah. whether 
whether that's I think that genius and evolutionary psychology. Miriam. I just want to point out one thing. I, I suppose I worry a little bit that when we talk about it in terms of human nature, we miss the fact that genocides are the products of political processes. And, and in Bosnia, it was the product of a political process, the breakdown of the former Yugoslavia, the rise of ethno-nationalism and this idea of a greater Serbia. Um, there are political processes at work which lead to the need to create divisions, as um, we heard from the expert who was saying, you know, these are constructed divisions, particularly in Bosnia. People were being identified as Muslim on the basis sometimes of merely being circumcised. I mean, people didn't have those divisions. People were intermarrying. It was one of the most yeah. integrated societies you could identify. Yeah. It was the coming out of communism. Part. I think that's the hopeful part. Or the but scary is, part, mm. because it well, is the on, same I'm society that so, disintegrates. So uh, the difference in genocide, so if you have violence on, a small, on an individual level going down and the instinct to go down, hopefully, but on a national level we continue with genocides, what is the difference is the mechanization, as you said, in the mm. technology and the political process so yeah. therefore if we have more intervention by governments on that nationally and internationally that can be hopeful. Tommy what have you has been saying? Well, Sean, understandably a lot of people are questioning human nature off the back of this debate. Uh, Rob in, uh, on Twitter saying human nature is fairly rotten if left to its own devices and we need to constantly work to communicate and empathize to survive. Lee, who says, well, look, look at the popularity of films that include torture, that include killing and rape as entertainment. A great many people are drawn to darkness and it's not a million miles away from there to genocide. Jean saying, man does not learn from history and we are doomed to repeat it. We do not acknowledge God and are more concerned with our own selfish needs. Sean. That's an interesting point. Man does not learn from history, Rabbi Noah. So I think we do learn from history, and I really wanted to object to this idea of being rotten. I, I, it is not my experience of other people. People are good and loving. Douglas? I don't know. My observation is that the timber which we made from is crooked, but it can be improved and it can be worked on, but uh, not very much. I, I just make one very quick point about the, the teaching of history. It is very important that you, when you teach history, you get it right and you put it in a context. And I do worry, I have to say, that uh, the obsession, for instance, with World War II in schools in recent years can sometimes lead children to think everything is a potential genocide, as it were, and often everything is a potential Holocaust. Well, do have Donald to thinks the future very genocide is inevitable. Yeah, I mean, you do have to, I, I think people also have to, particularly with young children, have to show that there are, there are all sorts of things that add into this context. It's not, it's not the case that history perpetually repeats okay, itself. Okay, briefly, Michael. I really think this view of human nature as being good or bad is completely misguided. I mean, so we have adaptations that make us good and those that, mm. that make us do great, wonderful, loving things, and it's a matter of understanding mm. how we encourage the good adaptations and discourage the bad ones. So this idea that human nature is inherently evil or inherently good is really wrong-headed. It's, it's, we're, we're capable of both, and, and it's the secret for... It, it tells us why we can be evil it also tells us how to overcome that evil. Many thanks to you all uh, for joining us for that debate and thanks too um, to Donald there in Edinburgh. That's almost it for this morning. Uh, thanks again to you at home for joining in. We're going to be back next Sunday. Before we go, we have a question for you. What happened to the undesirables of Victorian society? Alcoholics, addicts and prostitutes. Not welcome in polite Christian company. A preacher and his wife set about saving them. 150 years on, the Salvation Army is a global organisation. They're here to play us out. Let's hear them. Goodbye.